Well, hello and welcome to another online Bible study. This is for our Sunday service that's coming up. And in fact, this is our final message of Jesus is in the house. This is number nine. And today we will be looking at the house of Zacchaeus. Everybody's familiar with that story. It's found, of course, in Luke chapter 19, uh, verses 1 through 10. And there are a lot of other homes that we could get into. And this is also out of order uh, with what we had done with our last message of looking at the Passover house. But there's a reason. I like this house. And I think because of the familiarity um, with Zacchaeus, and if you're a Christian and you've been raised up in church, boy, you're really familiar with uh, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. But this house, of course, precedes it, uh, the Passover house, but I wanted to save this till last. So let's get to reading. I've got a lot of uh, material to cover here in Luke chapter 19, starting with verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste, and come down, for today I must abide at thy, thy house. And he made haste, and came down, and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said, whoops, better get you the scriptures up there, huh? And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, this day is salvation come to this house for so much as he is also a son of Abraham. For the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Like most of our messages that we've looked at as far as the homes that Jesus entered into, we need to look at the situation prior to, to the entering in of this house. Well, I'm going to look at, of course, the person that owned the home, who he encountered there, what happened in the house. And I'm going to be giving you 13 different points of interest, at least they were interest to me, and then build upon those facts briefly um, that we can see. So the first one that we're going to look at, and I'm going to give you all 13 of those points and then break them down, go back in and look at each one. We're going to look at the situation. You'll find that in verse one, he entered into and passed through Jericho. Then the sinner, that of course is Zacchaeus. And then we're going to look at the search. Uh, that has to do with Zacchaeus's search. And some of these, like this one, both in chapter, or verse 3, you'll find it broken up. We're going to look at the stature, pay attention to him, and some things that we can gather from that. And then we'll look at the sycamore tree. We'll look at the siding. We'll look at the stay. Excuse me. And then the swiftness. Zacchaeus, hurry up and come down. And Zac. Zacchaeus did, in fact, hurry up and come down. You see that verses five and six. And then there's the satisfaction. Um, I'll get to that a little bit later and explain it. Then the scolding. That was kind of the Pharisees. They were scolding. Uh, they mur were murmuring. Um, we'll have more to say, of course, on that. Then the stand that Zacchaeus took. 
and then the salvation that Jesus said came to this house. And then lastly, the success. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. So first we're going to look at verse 1 again. And I'm not going to put all the verses back up there for you. So if you have your Bibles, that's a good thing for you to pull them out and be able to look at them. Uh, Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now it's interesting to note that Luke is the only one of the Gospels that records this particular event. And probably I give a little more time to this first point simply because there are writers, people who wrote commentaries, who will dispute points of the Bible, parts of the Bible. They'll say, well, this really isn't in there, or this was added. Look, I believe in an inspired and preserved Word of God. So I want to make sure that you understand that while Luke may be the only one that records this, remember that Luke talked to all the eyewitnesses, and he had perfect, he said, understanding. You see that in Luke verses 1 through 4, where it talks about how that, listen, I'm going to be setting forth all of these things that we most surely believed. He talked to a lot of people. He was like a biblical reporter, if you will, and talking to the firsthand witnesses, verse 2, even as they delivered them unto us, he gave the actual account, which he says from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all these things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of these things wherein thou hast been instructed. So just the background information, of course, and what we're getting out of Luke. Now, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And remember, we've already looked at the fact that he had set his face like a flint. His path was connected to what he was sent to do. And is actually quite interesting that as he is entering into and then passing through Jericho, that you can remember that this was a city that was cursed by God. It was cursed by God, but if we look back in history in 1 Kings 16 and 34, we find that there was a man that did read or rebuild this particular uh, city. So let's look a little bit again further at the situation that we see versus, or 1 Kings 16 and 34. In his days did Hiel the Bethlehite build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Abraham, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son, Sejim, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, it's interesting the way that this is written. You find out that this man was rebuilding this city, but his first son died as the building began, and his last son died as the city was finished, and every son died that he had in between this. And in fact, Joshua spoke about this when he told them. He adjured them in Joshua 6 and 26, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city, Jer Jericho, for he shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates thereof. It is true, but it was a dirty city, a cursed city. It was particularly dirty at the time of Jesus. I won't get into a lot of that. It had really become a, a very important economic uh, city for Rome. And they gathered their taxes there. Um, and there is a huge crowd that's following Jesus into Jerusalem, but they're following him there and Jericho, and even more probably from that, uh, came in close to him. So now we want to look at the sinner. We want to look at his station. Verse 2 says, And behold, there was a na man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. And he was rich. It's interesting to note, too, if you go back and look at that scripture, it says, And behold... Luke uses that word behold to tell you, pay attention to this. 
59 times in his gospel alone, he uses that word behold. And most of the time when you look at it, it has to do with Christ. And here he's talking about how important this man has a Jewish name. He is a tax collector. He's rich. And he is, in fact, a chief among the publicans. But here is, if you remember, there was once an encounter with Jesus and his disciples where he said it's harder for a rich man or it's harder, excuse me, for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to be saved. And yet here is a rich man being saved. With these things, Jesus also said, he also said with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. This was not the kind of man or the kind of Israelite that was well respected by the nation of Israel. He was considered a defiled sinner. Really, he was considered worse than the Gentile. And if there were any man who needed salvation in this cursed city, it was this cursed man. Now, Jesus didn't save him because somehow or another he had earned the right, the privilege, or had done some things right. Listen, this man was saved even while he was an unworthy, ungodly sinner. Isn't that great to know? Are you listening to this? If you too are a sinner, if you see yourself as unworthy, if you live in a cursed city, if you are cursed yourself, Christ is now passing by. Come and see. That's why then you see in verse 3, just the first part of verse 3, you see the search. Zacchaeus sought to see Jesus, who he was. He wanted to identify him. He'd heard this story before. I think it's about 14 miles from Jerusalem. Um, there are other cities that are close by that he could have heard or traveled to, but he did not. But he wants to find out. He's curious. He's curious about the one whom he has heard about, and he is eager, and he is making a great effort. I don't believe that Zacchaeus was seeking to be changed. In fact, I don't believe that Zacchaeus' search had a spiritual connotation to it at all at least not at the beginning, but by the end of this encounter, it will have a spiritual end. You may be one that's listening to this particular message on our YouTube channel. Maybe you're only curious. Maybe you have some temporal problem that you've heard about Jesus. You want to see about learning more. And somewhere along the line, you've become curious well, listen, that's okay for whatever reason you may be here. Many have been saved by Christ just simply because they were curious. They were there, but they were changed forever, who never intended any more than just to find out who he was and what was the fuss all about. Then look with me at the stature. Verse 3, and the latter part of that, again, Zacchaeus sought to see Jesus, who he was, and he could not for the press. There was a big crowd, but it wasn't just the crowd that stopped him. He was a little man. I can identify that if there's a lot of people in front of something that I want to see, a lot of times they're taller than me. I can't see around them. I can't see over them. And I'm not important enough to push through or for anybody to make way. That's what was going on here. But he was determined. The crowd was too thick to get through. He was too short to see over them. And no one is going to make room for this chief publican, this hated tax collector. It doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile here with this guy. This man had made his wealth off of the backs of the people that lived here. So he's not a well-liked man. But I do have to say he was creative in overcoming his natural ob obstructions that prevented him from getting to see Jesus. You think about it, so many men today, so many women today will never go beyond the simplest roadblock or obstacle to try to find Jesus. 
They won't try to present themselves and try to find out what can actually change their nature, their eternal destiny. If there an obstacle for you to overcome, run ahead, climb up in the tree. That's why then you look at the sycamore tree. Now, I'm not going to get into too much. There's a lot of discussion about what this tree was. I know this, it was a common tree in the plains. Some people will say it was a kind of a fig tree. We know this, it was a large, short, thick tree with sturdy, low branches. In other words, it was a wide open tree with low branches, very good for climbing up into. And a short man could do it. I'm sure that this was a man, though, when you think of Zacchaeus, that this is a man, a rich man, that's not accustomed to running around and climbing trees. But he overcame his pride. He ran ahead. He was determined. Maybe the Spirit was already moving upon him and moving in him. And you know what? Maybe after the story, if you ask Zacchaeus, what happened? He might tell you, I don't know why I did that, but I didn't care. I had to see him. I wanted to see him. He acted like a child and he did not care what others thought of him running and climbing up in that tree. In fact, it may have been that there were a lot of children that were also up in that tree. But I can tell you this, it was a providentially placed tree with a providential design that had a providential time appointed where Jesus and Zacchaeus would meet. It was the place where Christ would find one of his lost sheep of the house of Israel. The tree and Zacchaeus were fixed in the mind of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to me, his omniscience stands out boldly in this story. This man needed far more than just the tree to help him see Jesus and to see who Jesus really was. He needed Jesus to find him, not just that he would find Jesus. Among this huge crowd and possibly many that were already in the tree, what do we see next? We see the sighting. I'm not talking about the fact that Nick, or excuse me, start to say Nicodemus, but that uh, Zacchaeus saw Jesus. But when Jesus, it says in verse five, came to the place, he looked up and he saw him. He stopped, he looked up, he sighted Zacchaeus in the tree. Again, it may have been others, maybe children that were up in this tree wanting to see him. It seems very possible that that's common. And then all of a sudden, Jesus called him by name. Zacchaeus had to climb that tree just to see if he could identify Jesus. But then Jesus stops, looks right up at him and calls him by name. How do you know me? I would think that Zacchaeus might have said. C.H. Spurgeon, in preaching on this text, preached on the effectual call. He saw it as a gracious truth. And he makes comment this way. He said it was a personal call. It was a hastening call. It was a humbling call, an affectionate call, an abiding call, a necessary call, and an effectual call. My dear friend, Jesus knows where you are right now. He not only knows your location, he knows your heart. He knows what's going on in your life, and he knows your name. He called me. I can't say that it was a voice that I could hear with my ears, but it was just as real the day that Jesus saved my soul. I could hear him calling me. Can you hear him? Is he calling your name today? The next part of that verse is the stay. In the latter part of that verse, verse 5, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacharias, or Zacharias, Zacchaeus, I knew I was going to do that somewhere in this 
uh, calling him that every once in a while. But he said here, make haste and come down for today. I must abide at thy house. He's not just talking about a visit. He says, I must lodge at your house. I must stay at your home. So Jesus stopped first, saw him second, and then spoke to him and called him out personally. He told Zachary, there I go again, Zacchaeus, that he must abide, that he must stay. Jesus spoke to him with purpose and power. A fellow by the name of J.T. Woodhouse entitled his lesson on this passage, The Seeker Sought. Now, again, though this was a city cursed, and a city occupied by Pharisees and priests, yet Jesus passed by every other home. He passed by the self-righteous Pharisee, and by his own sovereign choice, told probably what most would consider the worst sinner of the city, that he must abide at his home, that he must stay with him, at his guest, as his guest. Then in verses five and six, we notice he says, Zacharias, make haste, come down quickly. And verse six, he made haste and he came down. Again, Jesus is telling him, hurry up and get down here. And that is exactly what Zacchaeus did. He hurried down. All I can say is that, listen, if you hear the voice of the Lord, harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation, but respond. Today is the day. If you hear his voice, come to him. Do not delay. Do not harden your heart. Be in a hurry to listen to him, to trust him. Then in verse 6, we see the satisfaction. And by that, I mean in verse 6, it says, He received him joyfully. He came down and he received him joyfully. He received him, in other words, rejoicing. It seems that there was a change that took place in this man's heart. His curiosity had now turned into something that made him rejoice at the spirit prospect of Jesus coming in and abiding in his house. There was another fellow, many of you might know him by the name of D.L. Moody. And some people have asked, well, when was Zacchaeus converted? And he said, as he was coming down somewhere between the limb and the ground, it sounds as good as any answer. If you have heard the voice, hurry, come down and receive him joyfully. The opportunity is there. Welcome Jesus into your home, into your heart. And then we notice how the crowd responded to what Jesus did and what he said. In verse 7, it says, And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Notice if you look at that verse for yourself, it says they all murmured. This was an agreement between them. They knew this man and his home and what he represented. They had, and we're talking about the Pharisees, had no sympathy for sinners and certainly no interest in Jesus' desire to save sinners. But my dear friend, let me tell you, while no one else may care for your soul, Jesus does. He cares for sinners. That's the very reason our last verse, verse 10, talks about that he came into the world to save lost sinners. Jesus literally shocked the crowd of those self-righteous Pharisees, and they objected to the design and the desire of Jesus. Well, I'm going to tell you right here and right now, When I'm talking about this house, I'm talking about Carmichael Baptist Church. This is a house that receives sinners. This is a house that invites sinners to come and find the love of Jesus Christ. Find the cleansing power of Jesus Christ. If you can't come here, we'd be more than proud to come to your house. Now, of course, that depends on where you live. If you're a long ways away, that might make it a little more difficult. But listen, would you like to know him? Then look for him to invite you. Then, too, in verse 8, we see the stand. 
After all that, it says in Zechariah, Zacchaeus stood. Now, just that little bit, again, from the Greek and from the most of what we can read about the customs of that day, it was this, if he stood up to make an announcement, and that's exactly what he did. He made a profession of his faith. He articulated what had happened. He said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. This really does speak of his resolve. He took a stand, not just literally, but he took a stand in his own heart. He professed his faith by showing the change. His conversion was instantaneous. And though this was exactly what the law required, that he return fourfold, he didn't do it to gain acceptance with Christ. He now is seeking to live his life in accordance with God's way and God's will. He doesn't deny his guilt. I have heard a lot of people say, well, if. Well, he shouldn't have put that word if. Well, the word if is not like the way we use it. It is the word if is not as if it was a question. But he's saying, whatever I have taken, I'm going to restore. Zacchaeus is not seeking righteousness through restitution. But he is seeking to restore what he has stolen because he has been made righteous. This is said to the Lord, not to the crowd, though I'm sure they heard him. This is a city now that would see a changed man from this day forward. He was determined to begin living a different life and to be a witness for Jesus Christ. I mentioned Spurgeon's outline of the effectual call earlier, and on his final point of dealing with the effectual call, he says Zacchaeus gave evidence of the effectual call. Zacchaeus, he said, had an open door. His table was spread. His heart was generous. His hands were washed. His conscience was unburdened, and his soul was joyful. Indeed, as we can see in verse 9, that salvation had come to this house. Jesus said unto him in verse 9, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he is also a son of Abraham. This was an encouragement to Zacchaeus. Man may reject you, but God has received you. This really was a rebuke to the Pharisees who had rejected Zacchaeus as an Israelite. But it also speaks to him as a child of faith. Um, when we look at the Pharisees, of course, what did they do? They claimed their birthright. But Jesus told them if they were Abraham's children, they would do the works of Abraham. Abraham, in fact, when we look at the scriptures, Romans 4, 11 and 12, it tells us that Abraham is the father of all them that believe. Abraham is the father not only of the circumcision, but of all of them who walk in his steps. It says, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. Why? That he might be the father of all them that believe. You believe? Then you too are a child of Abraham. Look at verse 12. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet been uncircumcised. You see, salvation has come to this house, to the whole house. The gospel had been preached here. Pardon and forgiveness of sin has been offered. Zacchaeus is now a child of Abraham twice over. Then lastly, after we've seen all of these other points, the success, the son of man. That's why I have it up there for you to see. The son of man has come to seek and to save. This is a story of success. He has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This is the mission of Christ. And this is exactly what happened on this day. The Son of Man came to save that which was lost. 
And Zacchaeus was one of those lost sheep of the house of Israel. Are you lost? Are you looking? Are you laboring? And come to try Christ and trust him. If you feel discarded, dishonorable, and a disreputable sinner, that's okay. That's who Christ came to save. Salvation has come to this house. Is Jesus seeking you? He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And I pray that you have been called and are converted today. Lord bless you.